This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me. I appreciate it. This episode features a chat with former In Flames members Peter Iowas and Daniel Svensson. Now, the catalyst for the conversation was the launch of the debut album for the Halo Effect titled Days of the Lost. So this chat has been available via the Scars and Guitars podcast app since June of 2022, and here it is for the first time on YouTube. I thought I'd put it up here because I have a vastly bigger audience on YouTube than I do by the podcast apps, and I wanted you to have a listen to it because I think many people wanted me to have a deeper conversation than I was able to with Jesper Stromblad, the great man, which only occurred a couple of nights ago. A lot of the questions that I would have liked to have asked Jasper, only 12 months before I'd asked Peter and Daniel. The chat was picked up by Blabbermouth. They pick up quite a bit of my stuff and I think they've picked up just about all of the Inflame stuff so far. <laughs> so that's interesting. But uh, yeah, in this chat here, I definitely go there. There's a very lengthy opening monologue there, but I just want to set the scene for what follows there and why I'm so keen to investigate aspects of the band members in flames career so here they are peter and daniel formerly of in flames hello how are you going good how are you good i love it i'm a bassist too mate leave it up <laughs> awesome <laughs> just gonna connect my headphones. i think dan's just connecting to audio now so huh there he is Sorry. yeah hello hey mate hi, hi. Okay. This is unusual. I don't often get the two members of ex members of In Flames. This is awesome. <laughs> you don't? Yeah. <laughs> well, I've spoken to uh, Bjorn and Anders before, but uh, this is quite a privilege, I must say. Uh, I'll get that out of the way straight away. Thank you. I'm, I'm a very big fan of the work you guys you. did in In Flames. I think it's extraordinary. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. How have the calls been going? Uh, you know, in light of the fact that you do have this new band here, but, uh, you know, I'll probably uh, follow a fairly similar trajectory to other people and talk a little bit about In Flames. But have people been asking you intelligent and insightful questions about this new outfit, the Halo Effect? Yeah, absolutely. I, I got to say, it seems to be a huge interest and uh, people are very well informed usually. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. I, I would think so too, given your history, both of your history and legacy and your association with the Gothenburg scene and Swedish metal in general. I was very, uh, when I uh, received the album or a bit of a heads up that you guys were back and you were doing something, and especially you've got Michael fronting the band too from Dark Tranquility, I was very excited. Then when I heard it and it sounds great, it didn't let me down. That's another very positive thing. <laughs> yeah. Happy to hear. Thanks. Yeah. Look, look for the benefit, I do host a podcast, so for the benefit of the listener, I'm going to do a bit of a career summary of all of the band's members, if that's okay, just to give some people some sure. context because I'm sure there's going to be some people listening that are like, why is Andrew being so enthusiastic about this outfit? Well, here's why. <laughs> Uh, I think it's important to go through this, as I say, because of your contribution to heavy metal over the decades. Michael, I'm going to mispronounce your Swedish names here, so my apologies in advance. I'm a shocker this way. Uh, Michael Stan or Stanny uh, is on vocals. Stan. Uh, Stan, there you Stan go. Meh. Stan Stan yeah. <laughs> there you go. My, my Swedish <laughs> students at university would be lambasting me for getting that wrong, so there you go. Um, but he's a, look, he is a foundation member of Dark Tranquility. Indeed, he is the sole remaining foundation member. Uh, Nicholas uh, Angelin, he was a member of the uh, Overlooked Gardenian. God, I remember them back in the day. And uh, yeah. he's a long-time associate. And, and, and sarcasm. And sarcasm. <laughs> okay, there you go. Yeah. Even older yeah. band. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there's just so many killer bands that emerged in that part of Sweden in the early 90s, late 80s, isn't there? And uh, But the thing about Nicholas is... Uh, He's still in Inflames, I understand. Okay, so he's a long-time associate and a tenured member uh, of Inflames. Now, he's the guy that I think a lot of people want to know a bit more about, Jesper Stromblad, uh, a f the founding member of Inflames, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, he's oh, been in, in, 
Yeah, an integral member of far too many bands to count, notably Hammerfall. I don't think people realise that he played a very integral role in Hammerfall early on. And and that leads me up to you guys. So, so Pete, of course, you, you were a member of In Flames for two decades and uh, you either still yeah. are or you were in Chira with uh, Jesper. And I, I and was. I did uh, one were. record with them. There you go, yeah. Um, and... Dan, of course, you were a member of In Flames for almost two decades as well, and that's my point there. So people who actually know, and I don't know I've spoken a lot, apologies for that, people are used to me doing that, but I just wanted to give people some background as to why I think it's so important that you guys are back and doing what it is that you do as a collective because I don't think you guys are a super group. I think you guys are a bit beyond that. I think you're, you're founders and you're an originators of a genre, you're popularizers of a genre called Mellow Death, call it whatever you will. Um, but, look, I love the fact that you're all together and a killing your band that honours the tremendous legacy that you've each established. Do you think that I've summarised? Thank you very much. Do you think it's an accurate yeah. summary? Yeah. Absolutely. Daniel uh, Daniel had an, another band as well, Sacrilege, before that. But Sacrilege, okay, gotcha. Flames. But mm. other than that, I think it was correct. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the name of the album, Days of the Lost, okay, uh, in many ways... Uh, as I say, I'm an old fan of In Flames. I feel like it's the spiritual successor to Reroute to Remain. Uh, in that In Flames' sound, it changed after that that album. I'm not saying for the worse. I'm just saying it changed because, you know, Anders didn't like me talking about that, but it is what it is. Um, <laughs> yeah. And and from soundtrack to your escape onwards. So almost two decades ago now, but do, do you agree that in some ways the album is a spiritual successor to Reroute to Remain? Oh, interesting. I, I haven't really thought about it. Um, when you make music uh, like we do, uh, you tend not to overthink stuff, right? You just go in and you write music and you kind of know that what comes out uh, will sound a certain way because of the style that we are playing and how we're playing and performing our, our music. So uh, I haven't really thought about it, but maybe, maybe it's not something... Uh, it was it was definitely nothing intentional. We we just went in. We had a bunch of ideas, and we came out with a, a bunch of songs that happened to sound a certain way. Um, but none of us really overthought it, and it was was never meant to. It's going to sound like this, or it's going to sound like that. We just mm. let's write this music and see what happens. And and because of uh, like I said, how we're playing, it will sound a certain way. Then yeah. what do you it's, think? It's hard yeah, for us. Yeah. Yeah, I, a lot of people like to analyze uh, music. Um, and of course, it sounds Gothenburg metal-ish because we all are uh, from that genre and uh, we are some of the people that kind of created it. So of course, it will sound Gothenburg metal-ish, in flames-ish. And then which era, I don't know. Uh, and as Peter said, uh, we don't really think about how it should sound. This is how we sound today. And uh, with our legacy, this is inevitable that we sound less we do. Yeah, I agree. It's not like you were going to, uh, I mean, potentially it could have happened, but I couldn't imagine that you'd sound any other way. But uh, I think m my comments allude to something else, the qualities there. Okay, and that's that's what I mean, that it's a spiritual successor to reroute to remain. I actually think this is the album that a lot of old fans of In Flames are going to pick up on and that might actually get them back into. It might help them join join the dots, so to speak, and actually try to understand what In Flames has been doing since then. Is that feedback that you've received? Some Sometimes, yeah. People, uh, I mean, obviously people like to do a lot of comparison, uh, comparison, um, a comparing is the word, uh, between us, but I know it's, it's, it's a difficult topic to discuss because none of us have, even though we've all been in, in flames at some point, none of us really thought about this as, as what, as if what you're saying, but then a lot of people that we speak to say it. So it's, it's kind of, uh, it's hard, a little hard to take in, uh, as we've been very, you know, uh, thorough in just writing music kind of, but, um, mm. I'd say it's a little flattering to hear it. Right. Well, you deserve it. It's a compliment. Thank well you. Learned. Yeah. 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 What about, were there riffs and ideas on Days of the Lost that were in the vault for decades? In other words, is this an album that was written over decades or is it, are these all brand new ideas that you came up with together? 
It's a little bit of both. Uh, there were some, at least some of my ideas uh, were old uh, and meant for something else. Um, then I, I played it and then we turned them into, we changed some stuff and maybe changed some tempos and stuff. But uh, some were new, some were old. Can't really say for the other guys because they were, I mean, all of the ideas were fresh for everybody else. And since we kind of wrote the album together and got inspired from each other's ideas, I, I guess you can say that everything was kind of fresh. It's not like we had songs laying around that were rejects from something else. It's just, I mean, you constantly write and you write in your head and like you write uh, and sometimes you put it down on tape and sometimes you don't. Um, is that the answer? <laughs> No, it's a good answer. It's a solid answer. And yeah. Daniel, was it the same thing uh, for you being the drummer? Of course, do you have some rhythmic ideas and cadences that you brought from way back into the fold this time around? No, not really. I, I, I always try to adapt my drumming into uh, what what the actual riff sound like. Um, so I always I try to. Um, how should I describe it? I don't want to destroy the music. <laughs> I, just, I try to add <laughs> a, a subtle extra. Uh, so I don't have any old ideas lying around. But the thing is, this time, because of the pandemic, we have a, we had a really long recording process. So we could uh, have long breaks in between the studio sessions, which made it easier to not uh, get trapped in a box doing the same thing all over, which easily could happen when you have like two weeks uh, drum session on an album it's hard mm -hmm. to come up with fresh ideas um, so uh, it was nice not having a stressful recording um, I could take my time or ev everyone could take a breather in between the songs and think about stuff and come up with new ideas who was the producer that you decided to work with uh, Oscar Nilsson is the guy who uh, produced and recorded the album with us and uh, then we uh, used the Jens Bogren uh, oh, as a mixer fantastic. and a master. Yeah. 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 So we, yeah. But Oscar was with us from, from the demo stages and uh, produced this together with the band. Yeah, well, Oscar, who, who else has Oscar worked with that, that might be prominent? Uh, I guess his uh, most recent big name is uh, Hank Van Hell, you know, the old Turbo Negro singer. Yeah. But he's done, he's done quite a lot of stuff, but I, I haven't really paid attention. But he's, he's a really good friend to Niklas to begin with, and he uh, took us into his studio where we could write and record demos, and then we all felt, felt comfortable working with him. So it's a really, yeah. really great, uh, great producer. Just talking about lyrical themes and some of the topics that were addressed this time around, can, can you speak for Michael on this one here? Do you know what he was singing about and what, what lyrical narrative that he brought to the album? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, rough, rough tempo. I mean, he, uh, he, he, he says he brought up things that he felt were mutual for, for all of us, like uh, the attraction to the metal, the, the being on being as an outsider, the only guy in, in your school listening to metal and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, trying to fit in while you grew up, but you always were that outsider and you kind of seeked your way into uh, meeting other outsiders and forming bands and and uh, doing stuff together and he could he wrote about how we all could relate to that matter and that's kind of days of the lost the meaning of the title in itself because um, you know when you grow up and you 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 I mean it's not always easy being an outsider but once you find out that there are other people like you and this is I mean growing up before social media and stuff like that you had nobody really to connect with you uh, kind of uh, cherish that after a while. And then when you met other people, you uh, felt like you belonged to a community all of a sudden. Like, um, mm. And I think that is something that we all shared, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I get that, yeah. Talking about a community and something you all share, you two have been a tremendous rhythm team, as I've mentioned, for decades now. What is, what is it about your playing that you, what is it about the way you guys gel? Because I'm a, I'm a musician too. I'm a bassist, so I know it's a, it's, a, in my opinion, it's probably the most important role in a band live, the drummer and the bass player to make sure that you guys lock in. So, what is it about each other's playing that you enjoy? I mean, f first of all, we've been doing uh, 
more than a thousand shows together, maybe two thousand shows together. Um, we know each other in and out, uh, both playing wise and, and privately. Mm. Um, and it's, it's been, it's becoming a symbiosis in between the drums and bass of all, uh, through all, the, all these years, I would say. Um, mm. it's, it's just, it, it's, it's like a self playing piano basically. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. And, and it's hard, it's hard to describe. No, you, you sum it up really well, Daniel. It's a symbiosis. And I think that uh, when when Daniel plays, I know exactly what to play on it. I know yeah. how his style is. I know, you know, uh, I mean, I always say Daniel is the grooviest drum machine. And I know, you know, it always, <laughs> never, never misses anything. Oh, it's always perfect, uh, but it's very groovy. And uh, even uh, you know, uh, comparing him to other drummers, it's it's been very easy to play with Daniel because because of the experience and because of um, the way that he plays that I really enjoy. So it, it's very natural. But it, but you know, and I think it was very early on as well. It's like I guess we have the same type of style uh, and thinking when it comes to the the backbone of the music. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you can't I, it has to be. Certain. Yeah, I think so. It, it has to be. I mean. I, I'm not that kind of uh, drummer that want to show off and stand out. I want to be the the bass, the fundament, uh, and just add some subtle things. And I think Peter has the same ideas when it comes to playing the bass, not freak out too much just to show off, you know? Mm. And that I think we kind of play in the same way, even though we have uh, two different instruments. Yeah, you definitely were a core part of that inflamed sound there. There's no doubt about it. It was, uh, I, I could, the guitars are one thing in inflames, like the twin lead thing, you know, the Adrian Smith, Dave Murray thing, but you guys definitely had the old Nico Steve thing going on there with the way you guys locked in. Because, thank you, you very much. Yeah, you could isolate your tracks and it sounded very musical and melodic. Cool. Appreciate cool. that. Yeah. Um, were there any any significant challenges in the studio with Days of the Lost that you, you know, did you go down any avenues where you had to do a U-turn or anything like that? No, uh, that's the great thing about it. I think Daniel said earlier that we had so long, uh, so much time in the studio. We started this project at the end of 2019. Mm. And then came the pandemic when we were almost ready to launch it then, you know, not that we had any record there or anything, but, you know, we wanted to go public with the name, but we couldn't. So, because nobody could tour. Um, so we had so much time and we just, we kept on writing, we kept on writing and writing and writing. And there's more material that that's not, that's not going to be on this album that we will save for later. Um, there, there were some parts obviously where you go in after a while and rethink, but I think we were all very thorough in, uh, in keeping the first impression, so to speak. Um, not change, not because I really don't like that when you go in after a while and you think that ah I should have done that instead, you know. Because we mm. we try to keep the first ideas uh, still there. Could have been a beat or, or or like a melody or something that was lifted out after a while, but no U-turns, no nothing. We we just kept on writing what felt good. Mm. Yeah, and also the knowledge that no one knew about the band because this was a secret. Uh, we really mm-hmm. didn't have any pressure on ourselves or expectations. We just. Uh, walked in, into the studio with a mindset of having fun. Um, it's it's more difficult when you when you are a band or already released a few albums. You know that people have expectations, and uh, that makes it a little bit more difficult. Now we were we could do whatever we wanted basically because no one knew yeah. that we existed. So it was much easier that way. I've asked this question of a lot of the Nuclear Blast artists, but did Marcus from, you know, the old Nuclear Blast owner, did he knock at your door with the Tonic Fire at all? Were you, were you, was it always just you were going to be working with Nuclear Blast? Uh, we sent it out to a couple of labels, and uh, I think there were a few, few interests, but, I mean, having worked with Nuclear Blast for such a long time and uh, also having worked with uh, with Robert when he was on uh, Century Media, uh, mm. I think that uh, um, I think that no, there, there, there wasn't really any op- other op- options for us. Yeah, as far as was I it, think, was it one of those situations though where you wanted to you want this band to be known as a completely new band, even though 
you all have such a rich history with Swedish death metal? Maybe. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, as in, there's one of those things where sometimes history can be overwhelming and the legacy can be a bit of a challenge to overcome and it can be known as former members mm. of band now have a new band. Do you? I mean, it sounds like as though you're comfortable with that, which I think is a wonderful thing because In Flames is such a, a great band from back in those times. But um, do you, would you prefer for people to know about this band just as, hey, look, it's the halo effect and it's just the halo effect or are you quite happy for it to be known as you know, you're all coming from different parts of Swedish death metal and this is just what you're doing right now? For me personally, I, I want to have it as a new band, but uh, it's uh, people will um, compare us with the flames and uh, bring up our history. But uh, we don't we don't talk about it ourselves. We don't want We want this band to be to stand out and do what it does uh, mm. because of what it is, not because of what we were, um, of course. But it's always we will always be compared with in flames, and people always ask questions about it and uh, it's I mean as you said we've been in the band for two decades but this is a new thing even though we have history uh, yeah, yeah. So. I think I think a lot of people in my position though especially given this might be the only chance I have to talk to you it's far too good an opportunity not to talk about some of these momentous things that you achieved whilst you're in in flames do, do you finding that though that people I mean with a lot of respect that I think people would be doing that is that what's happening in interviews yeah i mean it's inevitable and uh i i don't mind uh talking about it uh it's been a big part of our lives uh to be fair i spent more than half my life uh at least when i quit i spent almost half my life in in yeah. the band uh and it's a, it's a big part of my life and it's made a big impact on our lives on our lives um so i mean we will we will talk about it, but we prefer to talk about the new things and not yeah. drag in in flames, of course. But I mean, we are super proud of what we achieved, and a good thing about it is that at least I feel that I don't have anything to prove uh, anymore. So I can take this new band uh, less stressful, you know, because we already mm -hmm. been doing this for so long and achieved so much. So. That's a good feeling coming into this new band, knowing that it doesn't really matter. I, we've already done it, so this is just for the fun of it. Mm. Well, you you know, you both appeared on Colony. I think any of the musicians that were on Colony, you've got a ticket for the rest of your lives to do basically whatever you want to do, um, such as the the impact that that album had. So, are you are you can you tour at the moment? I mean, I understand most of Europe is opening up, but then, of course, we've got this bloody war situation, unfortunately, unfolding in the Ukraine. Have you got some shows booked in Europe? Yeah, there's. Uh, well, we have our first show on this Saturday in Sweden Rock. And then there's, uh, I think there's one in, uh, in Turkey and one in Slovenia uh, and one in Germany. Uh, we're doing, and we're also going over to Japan for a download fest in August. Uh, yeah. And then it's uh, it's a big tour uh, booked for uh, starting middle of September together with uh, Machine Head and uh, Amanda Marth, where we're supporting. Uh, Machine Head, that'll be interesting. Yeah, they're, I yeah. know their fans are you know they're morphing, they're becoming real metalheads these days. But uh, that's a big <laughs> that's a big deal for you guys to get that tour. I take it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, uh, friends of ours from before and the, we were looking for that very opportunity to go out onto a big stage and uh, and uh, get uh, some really nice exposure before two killer bands you know so uh, that's that's a very good good deal for us mm. look I, I mentioned colony uh, a moment ago and i've got a question for you about it uh, i i wrote a book you see and uh, anders and bjorn are in it uh, around my conversations, around some of the things that I've mentioned there about the change in the band sound. But look, you, you guys were there, so you know, but the group was a revelation by the time uh, Horacle had come out. And then when you guys came on board, I mean, the surging popularity on the Colony in 1999, it was one of those rare moments in heavy metal history where a band released a great album and then released an even better album 
with Colony. Colony is actually so good that I think it's one of the greatest albums from a Swedish outfit, which is kind of like saying it's one of the greatest heavy metal albums of all time. And I think people who know, they know. It's really, it's a wow. peerless Thanks. album. So look, when you guys were writing and recording Colony, did it did it feel like it was going to be a momentous release? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, it's, not it's really. Back to, <laughs> <laughs> it's like we never thought about stuff like that. Uh, we still don't, as you can see. We we mm. just in, into it to have fun, make music, and and you know go on tour. Uh, and I think the moment where you start re- start thinking like that, you know, that this is going to be this is going to be the album, you know, then, then um, I think some things can get lost a little bit in the process. It's, for me, it's really important just to stay focused and uh, do the best that we can and um, hope that that carries it all the way, so to speak. But it's, I mean, obviously you feel that this is a great song and this is a good, good uh, riff for whatever. And this can be really, really well achieved. But I mean, Colony was our first album uh, within Flames um, uh, recording. And, I was just psyched to to you know make an album. Yeah, I mean, but you know what I'm saying, don't you? I and mean, you see what people are wearing to the shows and stuff, the Colony T-shirts sure, or what yeah. have you. You know, I mean, it is. I remember thinking Horacle could never be better, and then the Colony came out, and it was just like, I can't believe what I'm hearing. And yeah. and I think it was. And I've got to give you guys a huge credit for this. You know, the internet had come along by then and people were turning away from magazines and Rolling Stone and all of that bullshit that had long since written off heavy metal. I don't know whether you guys felt it, but in countries like Britain, Australia, the United States, the so-called Western markets, it was in flames that was the tip of the spear. And in particular, it was Colony that brought heavy metal back into the spotlight. Please tell me that's feedback that you've been given before. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We, we've been getting lots of great feedback and bands saying that they were inspired and all that stuff and i think it's it's i mean i don't know if it's just because we're swedish and super humble but uh, it is hard to take in you know that you're mm. somebody's inspiration but when you stop and think about it it's a great honor to be considered that and uh, to have the the music considered like you said the the you know the greatest metal album uh, that's fantastic and we've mm. i mean we've heard lots and lots of, of um, stuff like this throughout the years and it obviously never gets tired to hear uh but i mean i i have such a hard time it's kind of like that was somebody else doing that you know yeah. i i never really think like that you know it's it's um i don't know why i mean obviously i enjoy it but i don't go around thinking hey i played on colony you know yeah uh, i i don't no, i don't do that i don't think like that yeah swedes are like australians we tend to be fairly humble and uh not really talk yeah. about success yeah feel like that way for you Daniel as well yeah well I think uh, why the album become like um, so important I think that's the time when In Flames decided to to start touring before it was a lot of different members or uh, switching place but I think mm. w- we decided to, to try to do our best and tour as much as possible and I think some of the songs are written more for a live environment than the previous albums uh, we started mm. to think more about the live show. That's why that album becomes or became uh, a little bit different. And uh, it, and it was a good good timing as well. Yeah, and as Peter said, I mean, sometimes you have to pinch your arm and think about it. But at the same time, if you get too satisfied, you, you stagnate. So you always try to improve. And uh, sometimes it makes you maybe forget about what you have achieved. Uh, Sometimes you need to to, to stay uh, and just uh, suck in all uh, uh, all positive words. Mm. But um, yeah, that's not our our best uh, thing. No, fair enough. Yeah, look, look. I mentioned uh, up top that I'd spoken to, uh, to Anders about the significant shift in the band's sound from soundtrack to your escape, and he wasn't rude to me or anything like that. But he didn't want to talk about it, and he firmly told me that we've always been like we control this shit, nobody else. No worries whatsoever there. Uh, I don't begrudge any band for doing what they need to do for any reason, whether it's for commercial reasons or artistic reasons. Um, but both of you were around for that shift and no doubt you, you felt some of the feedback back then from fans. As, as best as you, as you can recall, was it actually a strategy or a decision to chase a more you know, updated, more, let's say, radio-friendly or more, more rock sound? 
No, no, I no, don't think it, it was it's never it's the same. Oh. So it was the same, same in the flames. We write, we wrote songs that we enjoyed to play, and we didn't want to repeat ourselves. Um, but we've been answering this question several times, <laughs> but yeah, we, no, appreciate basically it, yeah. we don't want to play the, the same thing, the same song all over again. We want to uh, explore new uh, areas, no, even though we didn't want to um, get far, too far away from uh, what we do. But, uh, you know, it, it gets boring. And we wrote songs that we we liked and then people could take it or leave it. And I mean, they liked it. You yeah. know, yeah, Peter, same for you too, mate. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, once you start thinking about how things should sound, then it won't be natural, you know, then it won't be, uh, it won't turn out great when it, when it comes to our type of music. That's if you sit, if you're a songwriter who sit in the studio trying to, to write hits, that's different. But we never thought about that. We just tried to make music that we enjoyed ourselves. Uh, and we still do, you know, it's uh, mm. it's super easy to just talk about it. You know, that you, it's kind of like, um, it's just being honest, you know, it's like being honest. If you're always honest, you never have to remember a lie. You can always say, and that's the same mm. with music. If you just write what you feel, you can talk about it and you can feel it. You know, and at any point. Mm. Yeah, I like what you just sense, said. Yeah. yeah, you don't have to remember a lie. Or I like that. Or there's the myth yeah. of the lie too. You have to keep remembering the myth of what you keep yeah. saying at a particular point. Yeah, look, can't begrudge, as I say, the band for doing what you did. It, it ended up sending you guys into the stratosphere even more popular. You went from being a an underground, you know, people like me, an underground metal fan's favourite, to being a band that was even played on Triple M here, I think, at times. Um, yeah, and and I think even recently the 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 decisions that they've been the band have been making have put them even further into the spotlight by supporting Deep Purple. You saw the gig yeah. that the band did recently. Can't yeah. I mean success is success, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's something we always felt like doing. You know, crossing borders and and uh, working with uh, well bands and different styles and different producers and. Uh, you know, even signing record deals for, with a big label to get better distribution and stuff like that. You know, we've always tried uh, as as bands and as persons to think outside the box. Mm. Uh, just yeah. because you're a metal band doesn't mean you can't tour with Iron Maiden or Deep Purple or you know, uh, or extreme metal band. I think, and I think that's that's a good way of thinking, and we still do with Halo now. Yeah, well, look at the look at the tour you've just scored here with Machine Head. I, I wouldn't have picked that, yeah. but that's a, that's a wonderful thing because uh, their fans need to be exposed to some quality extreme metal such as you guys. Yeah, great. Uh, that's going to yeah. be awesome. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll make this my final question for you then because, you, as I say, you guys were around. You guys were back or you were around back then when, you know, the spark became a flame which became a bonfire. Do you agree with my opinion that without the Swedish contribution to rock and metal throughout the 90s, when rock and roll was all but cast out and declared dead, as I say, by Rolling Stone and all those bloody magazines and the American mainstream media, that if it wasn't for the Swedish contribution, and I suppose the black metal contribution from Norway as well, that rock and metal globally would not have surged in popularity as it did in the early 2000s as the internet took over. Do you guys think that it was really the Swedish and the Norwegian contribution that was the catalyst, if you like, for rock and metal to roar back into the mainstream. I think that we I were part know. of it, but then, then also after we started, it came a lot of bands from from uh, you know from uh, America and and all over that were inspired by this type of style, uh, came out and made it even more popular. And then we were inspired by those bands again, and then you know, they were inspired by us and go. So, I mean, it's really hard to say that it was the Swedish, but I know that we definitely had part of it. Absolutely. Uh, they're great mm. bands. I, I know, like, for instance, a band like Hammerfall, mm. I think they're solely responsible for bringing back power metal. metal. Agreed. Hadn't they been as, as huge uh, as they became, I think that a lot of bands would, wouldn't be around today. Kind of like just re revive that whole scene. And that, in my opinion, that was solely because of Hammerfall. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Daniel, your view on that? 
I agree uh, uh, about Hammerfall definitely. Uh, but I think if if it if it wouldn't have been for the Swedish or Norwegian bands, I think it's about timing. I think there will probably be another scene from another country that would have probably taken that place. Uh, now I think that there came a lot of bands from that this area at uh, at exactly the right time. So it's it's about timing as well. So I I think the scene maybe would have looked the same, but it and it could have been because of bands from other countries and regions. But I think the timing was perfect. So, but I, as yeah. Peter said, Hammerfall is solely <laughs> responsible for a revival of the power metal scene, definitely. So, so blame yeah, them. Without a doubt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, blame them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But blame them for bringing Judas Priest painkiller into the mainstream. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. no. <laughs> yeah, that's all good. But hey, one thing I will say is I think every metalcore band out there owes you guys a debt of gratitude. If it wasn't for you guys, I don't think metalcore would sound like it does. Well, I've spoken to a lot of friends in different metalcore bands that say they were really inspired. And then I go back to tell them, well, you're, you inspired us, you know? Mm. Bands like Kill Switch Engage and, and uh, Asylum yeah. Dying, uh, Trivium, Unearth, Devil Driver, you know, great, great bands that I still love today so i think and that's the fantastic thing about music that you can inspire each other back and forth mm. yeah you, you f- share that view too daniel on that point yeah i do um and you and i, I agree that metal core that the, the swedish bands started uh, and was a big influence on metal core but then it, the metal core scene evolved into something of its own uh, mm. pretty fast and then as Peter said we borrowed stuff from the metalcore scene uh, when it became like bigger and better uh, in the beginning I wasn't a big fan at all but uh, now as Peter said uh, I also love these bands uh, and uh, yeah I totally agree I mean we that's how music evolves you all inspire each other it's like a, it's like a tree the branches just go on and on Hmm. Yeah, I've spoken to a lot of Swedish musicians. I've done well over 700 interviews and I ask that question a lot because I'm 44, so I was around back in the 90s and I remember what it was like. It was dead. It was metal was all but gone. And I could remember the nuclear blast, the death is just the beginning compilations. Yeah. That's how I heard you guys. Yeah. Oh. And yeah, and, and I remember thinking, who is this fucking band? It just sounds unbelievable. You know, I was into Morbid Angel and Deicide and stuff, but I'd never heard anything quite like it. And I know that, my from talking to people, my experience has been repeated tens of maybe hundreds of thousands of time, times around the world. You know, old school Morbid Angel, Deicide fans, they hear you guys because we also loved Iron Maiden. And then there were some other things mixed in there again, some almost proggy, not pop, but, you know, Elements of bands like Rush and even Pink Floyd. I could hear Pink Floyd in In Flames too. Um, occasionally, you know, just with some of the the space that you'd leave between things. And uh, very inspiring. You're very you're spot on there. I mean, we uh, those bands and many other bands are bands that always inspired us. And I think uh, one of the keys keys to why we sound like we do uh, is because we don't let. You know, we we get we take inspiration from everywhere, mm. from all types of music, from uh, from each other. From uh, there's no limit, kind of. You know, uh, I think that maybe not so much these days, but in the past, a lot of bands were solely inspired by their own style. You know, which will mm. make them stagnate after a while. Uh, and I think what we always do with In Flames and with Halo Effect and anything else that we played on is uh, just you know uh, we expanded our our. Uh, views and whatever was good we incorporated that into our music mm. and i think also in gothenburg in the early 90s uh, everyone played with each other in different constellations mm. and some people listened to d-side some people listened to our maiden and the third guy listened to thin Lizzy, and that you know and then you, you created music and it become a, a mashup of all these genres um uh, we, we, I think we were thinking a little bit outside the box already, and we mixed everything within the not metal scene, but like new wave of British heavy metal with the death metal and some twin guitars. You know and that mm. that how we came out, and it was totally well, different. 
why, why do you think rock and metal has been so enduringly popular in Scandinavia from a uh, an innovation perspective? Okay, I know it's very popular in Germany and some other countries too, but in Scandinavia, there's always new shit coming out. There's you guys, Shira. There's so many great bands that are now mixing all of these things together. It never stagnates, but it's always been focused on rock and metal and bringing the genre forward. I can't say that in Australia. There was too many times, too many years where you, the, my, most of the rock places these days around me, for example, just play DJ music or just fucking Spotify over the speakers. But Scandinavia, it doesn't seem to be like that. And you guys have toured, so I think you understand what I'm saying. Do, yeah. do, do you do you have a view on why Scandinavians are so passionate about rock and metal? I think it's not only rock and metal. I think Scandinavians we uh, appreciate uh, like all styles. Uh, it's not only the metal style. It's uh, uh, all kinds of music, and I think Scandinavian Scandinavians are uh, open minded. I think somehow. So I think it's the same with other genres. It's not only rock and metal. So it's not unique for that kind kind of music. Hmm. It, it's and also I mean, when, it's also when that, it comes to yeah. Should I go? No, it's also like when we grew up. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it. <laughs> uh, it's like when we grew up, uh, there were a lot of youth centers where we could uh, rehearse and. Uh, meet uh, like-minded i mean going back to what i started, said in the beginning uh, meet people who also felt like outsiders and uh, you know do stuff together um we got to you know borrow equipment for free we had like uh, it's called a, like a study group where you if as long as you filled out the hours you were there you got the rehearsal space for free and that was like as it was amazing for for, for us to grow up and you know hang out with and I think that's part of it also because that created a community and you could, and then you moved on and you played at these uh, youth centers instead. And, and then somebody played at a bigger place and, a, you know, you, you were there as a, as a sport act or a stage hat or whatever, but everybody was involved in everything. And I also inspired everybody to keep on playing music. And uh, like Daniel said, not only metal, even though it might appear so, but we, I mean, we have lots and lots of great Swedish uh, DJs and uh, pop music and everything, so. Well, there you have it, everybody. A conversation with former In Flames members Peter Iwas and Daniel Svensson. Hope you enjoyed that. As I said in the introduction, there's many questions that I ask the two gents that I would have loved to have been able to ask Jesper, but it just wasn't that kind of an interview, was it? With Jesper, I mean, so. Maybe sometime there'll be another opportunity in the future, but I still think there's plenty of gold in that that conversation there with the great man, and it was just a privilege to actually finally meet him. I hold him in very, very high esteem up there, as a matter of fact, with Stuart Anstis. Okay, if you like that one, I do have some other In Flames conversations to share with you. There's a couple with Bjorn that are over on the Scars and Guitars podcast apps and one on YouTube as well. I have had a conversation with Anders, but it wasn't really an in-depth one. It was actually so fleeting that I didn't feel it was appropriate to release as a podcast episode. Probably had something to do with the fact that the audio was as bad as the one with Frost from Satyricon, but because Frost is hardly out there, I just thought I'd better release that and let the connoisseur discern if they want to dive into the terrible audio to listen to the conversational goal between me and Frost on that one. But yeah, Anders is a bit of a different character to Bjorn and uh, Jesper, it's fair to say. So I'd love to get the lowdown on what's been going on in that band. And maybe after everything has been said and done, we'll get the relationships a bit like what Stuart Anstis did with me. We'll understand a little bit more about the dynamic because I really have just focused on talking about the music. Nicholas Englund, though, I did... No, I didn't ask him any questions about the personalities, but he was very reluctant. Actually, he did not answer if he was still a member of In Flames or not. And a few people took me to task over that. God knows why. So you can't ask somebody if they're in a band, apparently, according to some. But the Nicholas England conversation is very engaging as well. All right. Go over to scarsandguitars.com if you like to listen to many more conversations from the world of hard rock, heavy metal, extreme metal and beyond. And if you like listening, I know you like reading because we're all intelligent people who listen to this show. 
I've released a book. Click the link in the banner on the website. You'll be taken to a marketplace of your choice. You know the rest of the deal. I've got some more information to share with you about the book, but before we get to that, I'm going to bid you a fond farewell. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast. Until next time, it's a very goodbye for now. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel, and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal, and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Super Joint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, Playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Borgir write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction. To George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, 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 just, I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldiner. Chuck was always, um, you know, he was. He was very, you know, very open-minded, and and he was into having his his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five, and Manson gave me that name, and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book.